The Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious, originally published in 1928, provides a clear and comprehensive introduction to Jungian analysis, analytical psychology, and Jung's theory of the unconscious. It is a summation of Jung's discoveries from 28 years of psychiatric practice, and is likely the best introduction from a primary source that is available to Jung's work, discussing how we can confront and integrate archetypes from the collective unconscious. The essay is collected in Volume 7 of Jung's Collected Works, along with the essay On the Psychology of the Unconscious, which provides a more general introduction to Jungian theory and its place within the psychoanalytic tradition. The volume is aptly titled Two Essays on Analytical Psychology, and you can find a video of the first essay linked in the description below. We proceed now with a simplified abridgment of The Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious. Part 1. The Effects of the Unconscious Upon Consciousness Chapter 1. The Personal and the Collective Unconscious Sigmund Freud believed that the unconscious holds repressed childhood tendencies and other psychic material. Although the unconscious can be analyzed, completely emptying it limits its productivity. Patients are encouraged to integrate repressed contents into their lives, yet the unconscious will continue to generate dreams and fantasies beyond personal experiences. For instance, a woman patient with a father complex became a philosophy student to break free from her emotional entanglement. However, her progress halted, which caused inner conflict and neurotic symptoms. She transferred her father complex onto the doctor, seeing him as a savior. While this temporarily relieved the neurosis, it was not a cure. In the state of transference, a patient's enthusiasm and willpower can lead to a leap towards practical healing. However, if this leap fails, resolving the transference becomes a problem. Dreams offer a glimpse into the unconscious and can provide guidance. Dreams are natural products of the psyche that reveal important trends. Analyzing the patient's dreams, I discovered a strong attachment to the idea of the doctor as a father-lover, reinforcing the problematic bond. The unconscious emphasized the supernatural nature of this bond, and I wondered if the patient truly understood the fantastical nature of her feelings, or if the unconscious was beyond comprehension. Reflecting on the dreams, a new idea emerged. The dreams used familiar metaphors, but the patient recognized the distinction between my role as a doctor and my real self. The purpose of the dreams remained uncertain, but their persistence hinted at an important instinct. I questioned whether the unconscious aimed to elevate the doctor to a godlike status. Was it a misinterpretation by the conscious mind, masking a deep longing for a true god? Could this desire for a god be a powerful force rooted in our primal nature, surpassing love for a mere mortal? Or did it signify the essence of transference, a remnant of divine love lost over time? It seemed extraordinary that within a clinical setting, a relic of religious psychology would manifest as a vivid reality embodied in the figure of the doctor. A scientific approach requires impartiality, so we must evaluate the explanatory value of this hypothesis. The idea of the unconscious having a goal beyond the individual is as plausible as it being solely wishful, but only experience can determine which hypothesis is more suitable. While my critical patient found the new hypothesis less likely, she acknowledged its theoretical possibility. Gradually, the transference faded without causing catastrophe. I observed the unconscious emergence of a transpersonal control point, symbolized as a vision of God, which influenced her conscious mind. I realized the dreams represented unconscious growth, enabling the patient to break free from meaningless personal attachment. The dreams portrayed the doctor as a superhuman primal father figure, cradling the dreamer like an infant in the wind's embrace. Despite the patient's critical agnostic stance on religion, the god image in the dreams resembled an ancient nature spirit. These dreams transcended her conscious concept of God, aligning with an archaic mindset rather than sentimental childhood memories. Primordial ideas differ from the pre-conscious and unconscious. The personal unconscious comprises acquired and potentially conscious psychological elements. Repressed contents can be recognized, which can lead to a sense of moral inferiority. Assimilating the personal unconscious enhances self-knowledge and morality. However, the effects of self-knowledge vary among individuals, as explored in the next chapter. 
but the unconscious holds more than personal experiences. The God image example reveals an ancient collective archetype in the patient's unconscious. It is not a personal acquisition, but an inherited collective component. This supports the concept of a collective unconscious, where impersonal archetypes reside. These inherited thought patterns manifest through analogical thinking in dreams. Chapter 2 Phenomena Resulting from the Assimilation of the Unconscious Assimilating the unconscious has varying effects. Some patients become overly confident and take exaggerated responsibility, while others feel overwhelmed and lose self-confidence. These reactions reflect feelings of impotence and a will to power. Alfred Adler referred to this phenomenon as godlikeness, which involves understanding the good and evil in unconscious contents. It can result in feelings of superiority or helplessness. Insight from psychoanalysis can be painful when the shadow side is neglected. Some become depressed, doubting everything and forgetting that others have shadows too. Arrogance and despondency stem from uncertain boundaries. Psychic inflation extends the personality beyond limits, as seen in identifying solely with professions or titles. Knowledge-based inflation involves significant fantasies, and a lack of personal value can lead to the patient becoming overwhelmed. On the other hand, Arthur Schopenhauer abstracted and expressed this universally. Both the mentally ill and the philosopher grasp the vision as part of our collective consciousness, but the philosopher is able to transmute the vision into a shared abstract idea. Transpersonal contents compensate for personal deficiencies, but lack true personality. The collective unconscious entices, and can lead to both profound transformations and schizophrenia. The human psyche is both individual and collective, with collective tendencies opposing individual needs. Illegitimate annexation of the collective psyche devalues the personality, and integration of the personal unconscious fosters solidarity. Assimilation of the collective psyche dissolves the personality into opposing pairs. Personal development reveals these irreconcilable opposites, which leads to the repression of one half of the personality. Dissolution into the collective unconscious is dangerous, as is the neglection of one's personal differentiation, for differentiation from the collective psyche is crucial for personal development. Identification with the collective stifles individuality, hampers moral and spiritual progress, and promotes destructive forces. Larger societies suffer from moral degeneration and hindered individuality. Freedom is essential for morality, and the influence of the collective unconscious is often misunderstood as pathology. Defying societal norms may be seen as crazy, but true genius can be recognized in it later on. Humor is vital for preserving the freedom of the soul. The maintenance of integrity requires us to distinguish personal and collective contents. Personal psychology is intertwined with the collective psyche, which can overshadow our individual traits. Individuation requires protecting individuality from imitation and superficial differentiation, and genuine individuality demands deep reflection to discover. Chapter 3 The Persona as a Segment of the Collective Psyche Incorporating personal contents from the unconscious can lead to the inflation and enlargement of the personality by annexing deeper layers of the collective unconscious. The persona, which is a crafted segment of the conscious personality, represents a compromise between the individual and society. Analyzing the persona reveals its collective nature and secondary reality. The unconscious self and true individuality persist alongside the persona. When personal repressions are lifted, individuality and the collective psyche merge, unleashing repressed personal fantasies. Cosmic dreams and mythological motifs signify the influence of the collective unconscious, and the dissolution of the persona invites involuntary fantasies governed by the collective psyche. Embracing this process is necessary to overcome daunting challenges, yet the dominance of unconscious influences and the loss of conscious control creates psychic disequilibrium. This disequilibrium is intentionally induced in psychoanalysis to resolve obstacles. The imbalance resembles psychosis, but leads to greater health, activating the unconscious and bringing about a change in attitude. 
a stronger individual perceives these experiences as healing and understands human suffering within the context of eternity. Imbalance replaces defective consciousness with the instinctive activity of the unconscious. Assimilating the unconscious contents allows for a new balance. Unconscious domination without understanding can lead to psychosis, and so understanding the collective unconscious presents a significant challenge. This we shall explore in the following chapter. Chapter 4. Negative Attempts to Free the Individuality from the Collective Psyche The collapse of the conscious attitude leads to chaos, and the collective unconscious offers a new direction. Reactions to this vary, including destructive ideas, paranoia, or demoralization. How one responds to the unconscious determines the outcome. It's important to expand one's personality and take risks, instead of regressing. Sometimes challenging patients with Freudian or Adlerian theories of neurosis works to bring patients back to reality, but in other cases, recognizing the importance of unconscious self-regulation is key. Those who dismiss the unconscious regress and restore their shattered persona. The power of the unconscious cannot be completely eliminated, it remains active as a source of libido. Emptying the unconscious through self-deception is a delusion, and restoring the persona through regression is only suitable for those who are inflated with their own failures. Resignation and self-belittlement only lead to evasion and neuroticism. Unfortunately, in our culture individuals facing these challenges often lack support, as psychology often provides reductive interpretations that serve only the doctor's self-interest. Identifying with the collective psyche is tempting, as it offers renewal and access to buried treasures. However, it leads to self-destruction and a loss of self-criticism. Heroes triumph over it, but caution is needed. Becoming a prophet's disciple brings joy, as one avoids responsibility. Mental laziness becomes a virtue, as one needs no original ideas. One forms a collective agreement, reviling dissenters and suppressing individuality. This disciple fantasy compensates for the loss of freedom, but ultimately these tendencies lead nowhere significant. Part 2. Individuation Chapter 1. The Function of the Unconscious Individuation is the ultimate goal of psychic life, where one embraces their unique self within the collective framework. This goes beyond individualism, nurturing personal qualities in harmony with universal functions. It is not selfishness but the realization of one's true nature. Individuation seeks to uncover the persona's facade and understand the profound processes of the collective unconscious. Inner transformations observed in mental illness, creativity and religious conversion offer insights into these profound changes. Personality shifts are not solely influenced by external factors, subjective inner causes play a significant role. Pathological changes result from inherited or acquired dispositions, while creative intuitions and religious conversions stem from independent interior processes. These transformations may seem sudden, but they brew for years, with early signs indicating abnormal developments. Symbolic behaviors also foreshadow psychological issues, gradually building up over time. The unconscious processes that foreshadow psychological issues manifest through symptoms, actions, opinions, affects, fantasies and dreams. The unconscious, active even during sleep and slips of the tongue, complements conscious awareness to form the self. It compensates the ego, revealing overlooked motives and meanings. Expanding self-knowledge diminishes the personal unconscious, leading to a broader consciousness connected to the world. Collective problems activate the collective unconscious, influencing many beyond the individual. Dreams hold significance based on instinctive feelings and the need for communication. The collective unconscious impacts relationships, extending beyond personal and family connections. It drives people to reveal and confess, manifesting in dramatic expressions. The unconscious compensates for imbalances, prompting individuals to assert themselves, or to rise above others' underestimations. Compulsion neuroses exhibit meticulousness and moral appearances, but conceal ruthless evil and inhuman beastliness. Patients often perform ceremonial acts to counteract the lurking evil. For example, 
one patient's dream revealed the necessity of a pact with the devil to return to reality. Another dream addressed the relativity of good and evil. Legitimate interest in impersonal problems stems from genuine needs, while illegitimate interest produces personal compensations. The unconscious presents images from emotional depths, offering answers to profound questions, and emphasizing the interdependence of good and evil. The psychologist must approach the unconscious objectively, and recognize the legitimacy of impersonal problems. Conflict may seem unsolvable due to the presence of biased perspectives influenced by time and place, yet complex dream images reveal instinctive common sense. Chinese philosophy recognized this, and that unconscious compensations shouldn't be judged solely from a conscious standpoint. The unconscious can take initiative and lead. However, apathetic unconsciousness can lead to neurosis through the unconscious's contrived intervention. It doesn't operate with a deliberate plan, but simply seeks self-realization. Neurosis arises when individuals of a higher type remain too long on a primitive level, causing a neurotic explosion. The unconscious continually supplies contents that expand consciousness, functioning independently within its own reality. The belief in a distinct spirit world has been long-standing. Primitives acknowledge magical influences and spirits separate from their own souls. After death, the soul becomes a spirit with a deteriorated character. Tricks played by spirits align with spiritualistic experiences and reflect unconscious complexes. The significance of the parental complex in modern psychology stems from primitive man's understanding of ancestral spirits. The reflected imago of a parent is projected unconsciously and continues as a spirit after the parent's death. As consciousness expands, projected psychic contents become quasi-external apparitions, partly integrated with the conscious subject. These complexes, often feminine, serve as sources of inspiration, warning, and supernatural information. They bridge the conscious and unconscious realms as partly autonomous entities. Chapter 2. Anima and Animus Women tend to produce an autonomous imago that is tied to consciousness, offering unique insights. On the other hand, masculine men hide their emotions and accumulate unconscious demands, yet the femininity of men clearly contributes to the feminine soul complex, as it is evident in art. Women are deeply involved in human experience, and the inherited collective images of women exist in men's unconscious. The unconscious feminine aspect of men is called the anima. We are here discussing the psychological recognition of a semi-autonomous psychic complex, which is distinct from philosophical or religious notions of the soul. Thus, the psychologist's understanding should not be limited by philosophers or theologians. In the East, both the anima and persona concepts are curiously absent, which hints at a compensatory relationship between them. The persona acts as a mask, hiding one's true nature and fulfilling societal expectations. Creating a socially acceptable persona demands self-sacrifice and can lead to unconscious divisions and repercussions. Those who excel in their personas often exhibit private struggles. The unconscious finds ways to manifest disturbances despite the crafted persona, and this interplay affects individuals and relationships. Identifications with social roles can lead to neuroses, manifesting as bad moods, phobias, vices and weakened self-discipline. The persona compensates for inner weakness, represented by the anima, which is projected onto others, often the spouse. This dynamic creates illusions and power struggles in relationships. To achieve self-realization, one must separate from the persona and become conscious of their relations with the anima. This process disrupts ideals, and acknowledging personal weaknesses becomes easier than shattering ideals. Distinguishing personal desires from unconscious influences is crucial, as is discerning the demands of roles and individual aspirations. An indescribable arbiter mediates the conflict, similar to, but not to be confused with, conscience. This polar tension regulates life's energy. The concept of personality stems from the persona, which can be identified with it to varying degrees. Autonomous complexes, including the anima, personify and can be projected onto others. The anima is often projected onto women, just as the woman's animus is projected onto men. Separation from the mother and childhood necessitates significant rituals and initiations. 
The mother protects her son from his inner darkness, while the father safeguards him from external dangers. In modern society, the wife assumes the role of the mother. This can lead to dependence, subservience, or tyranny. Recognizing the distinction from the persona and the anima is crucial. We must shed light on our inner world, acknowledge weaknesses, and avoid repression. Understanding societal expectations helps to develop a persona, and comprehending the anima is essential for men with a strong persona. Objectifying the anima allows personal dialogue, and engaging in conversation with oneself reveals objective thoughts and emotions. The conscious mind's repressive attitude leads to indirect emotional manifestations from the unconscious. However, adopting an objective attitude requires reckoning with self-deprecation and denial. Confronting uncomfortable truths and using affect as an opportunity for dialogue is essential. Honesty and a lack of anticipation are crucial for effectively engaging and educating the anima. The fear of the unknown within ourselves arises when our certainties are shattered by the realities of the unconscious. Exploration of the inner journey may only occur under duress for a disillusioned person, and seeking security by reaching back to the mother or relying on others is a natural response. The influence of ancient religions still resides within us and is capable of causing upheaval through dangerous ideas. Neglecting the inner realm has serious consequences, which is comparable to ignorance in the outer world. Objectifying the effects of the anima is crucial for self-cultivation and protection from invisible forces. Understanding the corresponding animus in women is challenging due to the identification with an autonomous complex. Women possess a different consciousness than men, which is more aware of relationships and less focused on objective facts. The animus generates opinions and convictions based on assumptions and childhood experiences, often dictating rational judgments. When the animus is projected onto men, it can manifest as all-knowing replicas of God. The animus, like the anima, generates possessive feelings and evades criticism with disputable opinions. These collective opinions overpower individuals and hinder genuine discussions. The animus stimulates critical argumentativeness in intellectual women, which stems from its extroversion. To reconcile with the animus, women must distance themselves from opinions, investigate their origins, and uncover the primordial images. The animus has a creative aspect, but can become dogmatic if wrongly cultivated. Neglecting the inner world's demands can lead to shifts in psychic gender and the neglection of the external world. In sum, the anima and animus represent the masculine and feminine aspects of the psyche. The anima often embodies a singular form, while the animus appears as elusive figures. Integrating their contents into awareness is the goal, so that we might make them conscious. Chapter 3. The Technique of Differentiation Between the Ego and the Figures of the Unconscious to transform the influence of the unconscious represented by the anima and animus is necessary in psychoanalysis. Simply interpreting unconscious processes is insufficient, and the focus should be on releasing and experiencing unconscious fantasies fully. Engaging with the unconscious requires an active stance, not passive observation. For instance, one patient had a fantasy where his fiancée jumped into a frozen river while he watched sadly. This fragment reflects the patient's passive attitude towards the unconscious. He experiences depressive thoughts rooted in unconscious fantasies, which are resistant to conscious critique and intellectual understanding. The unconscious psyche retains what falls into it, in turn affecting the conscious world. Releasing libido from the unconscious requires bringing forth the corresponding fantastical images. The unconscious serves a real purpose, and it exhibits hostility when the conscious assumes a false attitude towards it. To address my patient's conflict with nature, and the annihilation of his conscious values, he needed to de-intellectualize and embrace other functions like feeling. The unconscious should take the lead, and manifest itself as conscious fantasies. Objectivity is key, treating the mood as an object of inquiry, so that it doesn't dominate. Visualizing the mood in a fantasy image helps convert unconscious energy into conscious content. Active participation in the fantasy is crucial, behaving as he would in reality to acknowledge the reality value of the unconscious. 
Fantasies have a real effect despite the fear of them in our scientific era. They express something real, yet shouldn't be taken literally. In my patient's case, the suicide scene symbolizes his disconnection from the world and the anima. Making the fantasy conscious and actively exploring it allows him to gain influence over the unconscious. Continual realization and active participation in unconscious fantasies leads to an expanded conscious horizon and a change of personality, diminishing the influence of the unconscious. This transformation, known as the transcendent function, involves balancing the conscious and unconscious. Alchemy once symbolized this process through the blending of noble and base components. While personal experiences are difficult to convey fully, the perceptible change confirms their transformative power. The experiences of a woman patient illustrate the total experience and active involvement in personal transformation. In a vivid vision, the patient arranges statues around her in a tent-like structure and steps into a fiery ring to protect trees. This symbolizes the journey towards individuation and the union of opposites, leading to transformation and ascension. Such experiences arise from inner necessity and are not forced by the therapist. Of course, fantasies alone do not substitute for living, and the transcendent function must integrate with worldly tasks. Failure to realize unconscious contents can lead to possession states, where the unconscious dominates the conscious mind, manifesting as masculine demons in women and as succubi in men. Without individuation, one becomes entangled with others, causing disharmony and actions contrary to one's true nature. True deliverance comes from aligning one's actions with one's authentic self. Individuation is crucial for personal growth and societal progress, and emphasizes the importance of allowing right thinking to lead to right action. Chapter 4. The Manor Personality when the anima or animus transforms into a function of relationship between the conscious and unconscious, the ego disentangles from collective influences. The anima becomes a psychological function of intuition, akin to a spirit that sends messages. After the ego has taken over the source of libido and absorbed the mana of the anima or animus, it becomes a mana personality. However, the manner personality is also a dominant archetype of the collective unconscious, which is represented as a magical being of the same sex, and which approximates the consciousness of the self. The anima assumes merely the lowest rank in the unconscious hierarchy, with the manner personality being much greater. The manner personality rises up and identifies with the ego, offering occult qualities and magical knowledge. This presents the risk of inflating the conscious mind and hindering progress. In men, the mana personality is characterized by the magician archetype, while in women it is the sublime great mother. Inflation occurs when the ego falsely appropriates power, but has not truly conquered the anima or acquired mana. Instead, it becomes mixed with the mana personality, which increases its power. To progress, the ego must acknowledge its limited role and abandon pretenses of power, for balance is achieved through accommodation, not mastery. When the ego relinquishes its claim to victory, possession by the magician or great mother ends, leading to a midpoint of the personality, the next stage of growth. The integration of animus and anima phenomena within the conscious mind is the starting point. Personal fantasies evolve into collective symbols and initiation processes, and initiation ceremonies in various cultures symbolize the transition from an animal state to a human state. Unfortunately, modern society lacks comparable practices. The goal of analyzing the unconscious is to make its contents conscious and to integrate them with the ego. Yet we must beware the overpowering manner personality archetype that can hinder personal development. Defense lies in acknowledging one's weakness against the powers of the unconscious. Realizing the manner personality liberates one from parental influences, but concretizing it can lead to the devaluation of humanity. To preserve human dignity, one must avoid projecting values onto the archetype of the manner personality. Resist becoming a plaything of unconscious forces and approach the collective unconscious with respect. Various thinkers, including Christ, Nietzsche, and Goethe, have grappled with these problems. Nietzsche's ideal of mastery is impractical for most, so finding a balance based on individual capacities is crucial. 
dissolving the manner personality leads us back to ourselves. The self, an unknowable essence, represents the centre of our psychic life and purpose. It does not deify man or dethrone God. The concept of God signifies the independence and sovereignty of psychic contents. It's important not to artificially separate these contents, including evil or meaningless ones, as they enrich religious experience. Humanity still needs an authority and guidance, and acknowledging the divine attribute of autonomous contents allows us to recognize the importance of pondering the inconceivable. The self is the ultimate goal of our lives, and it compensates for the conflict between inner and outer aspects of experience. It represents both individuality and the collective. Recognizing the self in its irrational nature leads to individuation, wherein the ego becomes aligned with it. The self is unknowable but also essential for understanding psychology. It is an all-encompassing image, like the structure of an atom. Though my observations may be unfamiliar, I aim to reveal this unexplored realm of experience. While not providing any final answers, this essay serves as a tentative attempt in that direction. And that brings us to the end of The Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious. I hope you found this video useful and informative, and if you did, please consider subscribing with notifications on, or buying me a coffee through the link in the description. Both of these give me the encouragement to continue making videos like this, and are dearly appreciated. I hope that you have or have had a good day, and I'll see you next time.